Thanks for listening to the Clive Barker Podcast, the only podcast dedicated to the imagination of Clive Barker. In this episode, we talk about the audio version of the novella Hellraiser the Toll. And before that, we discuss news from the reef, including the new Candyman reboot produced by Jordan Peele. Then we go over the Kickstarter backer rewards that you can still get as of this recording. All right, well, here we are. This is episode 204, and we've got a lot of stuff to kind of catch up on um, today. And we will start with breaking news from the reef. And, oh, by the way, I'm Ryan. And I'm Joe. So, hey, uh, and <clears throat> this is the, the biggest news, I guess, for the day. We'll start with the biggest one. Uh, the Candy ba- Candyman reboot has been confirmed. Yeah, that's exciting. I heard that... Uh... The uh, soundtrack is going to be done by Christina Aguilera. She's going to be singing Candyman like all throughout the movie. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, it seems like after many months of speculation and uh, and rumors and stuff that was talked about maybe a year or so ago, maybe even two years ago. Yeah. Well, was this before – this was in talks even before the, the, the Scarlet – no, the wait – the toll was being written or something. I forgot. Anyway, so it seems after many months of speculation that the Candyman reboot that was being discussed with the, with Jordan Peele of yeah. Get Out fame. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, what I meant was that this project has been in the works even before Get Out was being made. So um, finally, it seems like it might be moving forward. And yeah. uh, they already announced that it's happening like what, 2020 and production yeah. will start this spring. And they already have a director attached to it, right? Yeah, and I think when they were in talks, Jordan Peele would have been the director, but now it's taken so long that he's become a big uh, he's become a big a big a big deal household name director, and so now it's going to be in his production company. Right, Monkey Paw Production Company and MGM. Yeah. They're they're going to produce and finance Candyman with Universal handling domestic theatrical mm-hmm. distribution. And the director they got attached to this right now is Nia Da Costa, who helmed the crime drama Little Woods. So um, I, I haven't seen that movie. Have you? Do you no. know anything about that? No, okay. I don't. I, yeah, I wanted to look her up and see if she'd done anything that I was familiar with. But <clears throat> so um, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, we'll see how this evolves. Uh, it's supposed to start production this spring, mm-hmm. and. Um, they call it a spiritual sequel, right? So it's not really a reboot, apparently. Yeah, and they, they say it returns to Cabrini Green, but I've also seen somewhere that it, it takes place in the area that was Cabrini Green before that subdivision or neighborhood started. Oh, cool. <clears throat> so so Cabrini kind of like, Green was... Mm, go like ahead. An, like an alternate origin story, I guess, that would not count the origin story from uh, Candyman 2. Right, because right. that's, so, that's all in New Orleans, and they would not they would get rid of all the New Orleans stuff, I guess. Yeah. Um, Speculation. What's interesting is that, yeah, Cabrini Green was actually demolished a long time ago. I think that Rahm Emanuel was the mayor of Chicago at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, I think. I remember reading stuff about Cabrini Green when we were preparing uh, some of our previous episodes where we talked about Candyman and the Forbidden. Yeah. And, um I was looking at that. It's like Cabrini Green is gone. So after that movie was made, maybe two or four years after, I think that they knocked everything down, and now it's it's apartment buildings or something like that again. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it's not a problem. That's what sets are for. If they have to bring up, you know, something in the background for that, but um, I, I'm surprised that it's going to be kind of more of like a spiritual sequel, and. Um, I don't know yet if Tony Todd has said anything about reprising his role as Candyman. Yeah. One guy on Twitter said, um, as long as they bring back Jake and they showed a picture of the little that little kid, Jake, you know, can't, yeah. can't fix that, better off dead. <laughs> yeah, that kid was great. Yeah. At, at the end of the, the movie, he shows up at the funeral and he mm-hmm. drops the, the hook into the, yeah. the grave and it's... You just hear that thing go clang, clang, yeah. clang. <laughs> you mean Candyman cool ain't real? Yeah. He had such a great accent. Um, 
So, yeah, I mean, I don't know if Tony Todd will be uh, connected to this. I would love to see him come back. Um, I, we mentioned this before, and other people have been asking me this by message and stuff. Uh, as soon as this this uh, movie started uh, being announced that it was going to be produced, people were like, well, do you think Tony Todd's going to come back? Do you think it's going to be the same same kind of Candyman? And it's like, I didn't know, because I was like, what if they try to ad adapt the Forbidden and be a little more faithful to it? I mean, they could try bringing someone different. But another part of me was telling me that, well, you know, Tony Todd has been Candyman for three movies. You know, he's become kind of a, a another horror icon. So it, it would be, I think, uh, poorly advised to, uh, to to recreate Candyman again and, and cast someone else. So I don't know. In my in my heart, I feel like I I need to have Tony Todd play Candyman. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and um, you're right. It would be it would be too hard to. I mean, I, there's no reason to to retell the same story again because that movie is near perfect. Um, yeah, and what what they expanded with the mythology mm -hmm. of the story, they expanded in a direction that I'm very comfortable with. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I think it would be nice. It would be nice to see an ad an adaptation of the Forbidden. But I, it, but if we saw that, I'd like to see it in like a Books of Blood anthology TV series, like has been sort of teased and rumored. You know, I I think that that would be great to tackle each Books of Blood story and and do them one hundred percent faithful and make that a TV anthology series that would just go on and on until all the Books of Blood stories are are done. <laughs> yeah, some of those would be hard though. Um, some of those stories would be a little difficult. Oh yeah, but I mean, you do it on like on on like Netflix or something, and then eat, they don't all have to be the same length. You know, Down Satan could be shorter than you know than some of the other ones, like Rawhead Rex. Dread. Yeah, Rawhead Rex could span like two or three episodes, and and uh, Down Satan could be just a short one, and yeah. Well, that's a, that's a beautiful dream. I hope it comes true. <laughs> yeah, but but as far as this goes, it would be a sequel or prequel or something to Candyman, you know, which is a slightly different animal than like the Forbidden. Right, and uh, it, we know that some stories have been adapted very differently. Like Lord of Illusions, supposed to be from the Last Illusion, but it's not really the Last yeah. Illusion. It's just loosely based on it. It's but, a, uh, yeah, it's about fifty percent the Last Illusion. So I don't know. What would you like to see them do with the Candyman? Would you like them to bring back uh, uh, Tony Todd and have the same jacket and the hook and the bees and stuff like that? Yes. I mean, I think from what I've read, they said that it was returning to Cabrini Green, but in a time before it was Cabrini Green. So that makes right. it sound like a prequel. And if it's a prequel to the movies, it should have Tony Todd because, I mean, it's weird to recast you know, and yeah. he's open to it. So, you know, I don't know. It's like this this Hellboy movie that's coming out. Is that is that a sequel to the other ones, or you know? But it has a, it doesn't have Ron huh. Perlman in it, or are they starting? I'm not over? sure. Because I'm not sure if it's a sequel or a reboot. It's just going to be a different adventure from Hellboy, and they recast um, mm -hmm. Ron Perlman, right? Yeah. So if, if they do something that's related to the Candyman movies, it needs to have Tony Todd. But if there's if there's like, OK, we're going to start all over again and do something new. I mean, I guess I, I don't know. It's really hard to accept somebody else. Well, what I was asking you was, what would you like to see them do with the movie? Yeah. Um, I'm I'm I don't know. I don't know. Okay. You know, I, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm, I was just happy with the first one. I don't really need another Candyman movie, but I, I'm open to it. I'm, I'm happy to watch and see, you know, see where it goes and see if we like it. it sure. Sure. It's, it's, I would like to see a little more about, um, about how, you know, how, uh, how this works with the idea of, of believing in something so hard that it comes to life and it actually yeah. affects people. And, uh, and I, I don't know. I guess I, I have to. Um, we have to wait and see what comes out of this. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to watch the Blu-rays that are coming out now from Candyman as well. Yeah. Yes. Um, so that's the other thing that the the, the Blu-ray, the Shout Factory Blu-ray is out now. Um, so I want to get that. 
I need to. Yeah. So now there's two of them, right? There's the Arrow release, uh, yeah. Arrow video, and now there's the Shout Factory one. Yeah. And, and they I, have diff different stuff, I think. And I've heard on um, I've heard on on David's um, David's podcast on on Cinema Bluster that he has both, mm -hmm. and he says that the he thinks the Arrow one looks nicer. Okay, that's and, good. And he says that the European cut of the movie is three seconds longer than than the American North American version. Oh yeah, because they have the two different versions in the same disc, right? I think I read about that. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, he says I think there's like a gory part that's like three seconds longer or something, and that's the only difference. Yeah, the the psychiatrist's <laughs> office scene, I think. Yeah, oh. yeah. Yeah. yeah, where you see the the wires and the <laughs> where you see the wires uh, behind Tony Todd as he like gets yeah. whisked out of the window. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess that's one of the things for um, that's one of the negatives for for high definition is that you know all of that stuff becomes so apparent. Yeah, you see the edges of the makeup, you see the the wires and stuff. Unless unless they do um, like they did for Blade Runner, where they decided to just go in and fix some things with the CGI and. And erase some wires here and there, and just put like uh, Joanna Cassidy's face on one of the the replicants that gets killed instead of seeing that it's the, the stunt double. Uh, so they oh. did a good job on that Blade Runner one. Yeah, but yeah. of course it takes money, right? Mm -hmm. so. Well, and then and then it's it's a little dangerous because it runs the risk of people making changes that the audience won't appreciate, like George Lucas. You know, <coughs> George tweak, Lucas <laughs> tweaking the Star Wars movies, or or what was the thing with with um, Steven Spielberg and E.T. Right? Did he take their guns away and change them into flashlights? The government agents. Yeah, he changed the guns and turned them into like cell phones or something. Yeah, mm. <laughs> that's not not a good change. Yeah, mm. no, doesn't doesn't look nice at all. Um, but anyway, so that there's that about Candyman. So the reboot confirmed. Uh, yeah. Production starts this spring, and hopefully it'll be out by 2020. Yeah. But I, I, I've been wary of news like this coming out all the time. Like Jacqueline S is going to be done by this and that, yeah. and it's going to come out, yeah. you know, in a couple of years. And uh, they're just trying to get the funding, and then boom, it kind of stalls, and then yeah. you never hear of that again. So and this we'll see what happens with this. We'll keep. This originated with bloody disgusting, right? Because they, they uh, like a couple of a month ago or so, they're like, "Oh, this, you know, exclusive. There's going to be a Candyman reboot with Jordan Peele," and we're like, "We talked about this a long time ago." And then right. now they came back again, and they're like, "Remember when we?" They, and I, I commented on their site about that, and they just ignored me. And then they come back this time, and they're like. Well, remember that exclusive story that we had? Well, now we have more details. And so that's where this all came from. And a lot of people have been reblogging it, uh, including mm -hmm. us. But, um, but yeah, now we have a director and we have a, a date, you know, and, and it's, and, and that it's being produced by Jordan Peele's monkey paw. Um, so it seems production company. Yeah. I mean, it, it seems more, um, more concrete now. I guess well, this yeah. article that came out now it's from Variety, so I guess that makes it a little more official. Um, well, I think so, Variety. Yeah. No, re I no. think they reblogged it from Bloody Disgusting. Oh, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, so Candyman reboot confirmed. Uh, that's something to look forward to, and I hope that Tony Todd is involved. Yeah, yeah, and then um, next up. Um, Phil and Sarah was were teasing uh, teasing people on Twitter. They said, "Clive Barker, Clive can't wait to share all the projects that are either under wraps in prog or, or in progress at present. Stay tuned." So uh -huh. um, we don't know <laughs> we don't know what those things are. I'm looking forward to finding out. Well, that's that's why they call it a tease, right? Yeah. Uh, so people now will start speculating about what's coming out. Um, we have no idea what sort of projects um, are being teased here. Uh, maybe we'll have more news coming soon as uh, as we get more information from the Clyde Barker people. So, yeah, stay tuned. We will always keep you guys informed as soon as we know anything about these new projects coming out. Yeah. Um, and speaking of Clive, he's going to be at Days of the Dead in Atlanta. And we didn't really talk about this because it... it it, this one didn't really get advertised right away. It just all of a sudden show, kind of showed up on their website, which surprised people. 
Right. And uh, a lot of people were just waiting on the, the announcement for the guests. And uh, I know, like Lori from Simon Banford Fans, she was she was very excited about this. And uh, it's not just going to be Clive. It's going to be Clive and Simon, uh, Doug Bradley, uh, Barbie Wild, Nicholas Vince. Yeah. So it's going to be the gangs all there, right? That's, that's another one of those yeah. uh, photo ops that you can take with everybody from Hellraiser. Yep. Well, uh, maybe not everybody because Ashley Lawrence is not there, but you know. Yeah, yeah, but but uh, the same the same group that was at Texas Frightmare Weekend. Um, Hashtag bring back Kirsty. <laughs> yeah, right. But I think she was at um, Days of the Dead in Chicago. Oh, was she? I okay. Think, mm -hmm. Yeah. That's nice. I hope a lot of people got autographs from her then. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and another cool one I thought was. Uh, uh, Tsutomo Kitagawa, um, who played Godzilla, uh, Godzilla in Godzilla 2000, is going to be there. So that would be really cool. I wish, <laughs> I wish I could go. Yeah. Well, who who knows? I mean, uh, let's see what happens, and uh, maybe we'll be able to go there. Yeah, you're right. Ashley Lawrence was there at the uh, Days of the Dead Chicago. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, and she wanted to go to Texas Frightmare Weekend, but they, you know, they, I guess they, they were pretty, uh, pretty crowded and filled up, and they had their ideas about, you know, they wanted to only have Cenobite actors. Right. I still need to get her signature on my Hellbound poster because oh, yeah. I got everybody there except except for Kirsty and Peter Atkins, the writer, and if I could get those two signatures on that Hellbound poster, man, that would be oh, sweet. Yeah. That'd be a sweet thing to put on your wall. Um, yeah. So yeah, uh, Julia. Oh right, of course, Claire Higgins as well. Uh, yeah. That that would be tremendous. But uh, is she even in the uh, convention circuit? I don't think I, I don't yeah. think so. Yeah, I met her. Is she? Yeah, she was oh. at um, at Monster Mania. Oh, awesome! That's really cool. Oh, Imaginer Six has already started to arriving. People are showing pictures of them on Facebook and stuff. So. <clears throat> people seem That's really wonderful. happy with it yeah and do you know that little postcard that comes with imaginary six that has that little uh, um, uh monster with a human face mask that's actually the complete version of our poster on our kickstarter for uh do not trust the smiling world have you noticed that oh no i haven't Right. Huh. So I, it, it seems like this print that we have, um, that we got uh, a bunch of them from Century Guild, was a preliminary sketch. And then the new postcard that comes with Imaginary 6 is the finished version of that particular piece of work. Oh, so that, wow. That's very cool. That is really cool. And we'll, we'll be coming back, uh, coming back to that here when we talk about our, our Kickstarter update. That'll be interesting. Right. Yeah. Um, and oh, the Dead Mouse people. This is um, <clears throat> just kind of a shout out to them because they're they're uh, always busy. There, it seems like they're always now they're making fictional stuff and and um, side by side with their documentaries. Now they're working on a Night of the Demons documentary. Right, that's that's one of those cool movies too. Um, it's got Linnea Quigley and there's a bunch of kids that. Uh, go into like a, a, a house and then the house gets possessed by demons or whatever. And yeah. it's been a while since I've saw that movie, but I remember that movie is pretty wild. I think it was a movie theater. I think. I think it's a house. It's a house party. And then um, a demon uh, possesses the host of the party, the hostess. And then she, uh, she kind of possesses everybody else. And then the, they try to jump out of the house because the gates are closed and the the door the door to the house is closed and uh, all hell breaks loose. Uh, it's a really good movie. <clears throat> maybe I'm confusing it with a sequel. Yeah, maybe. But so they've done a lot of documentaries. They're always jumping from pr project to project. They started with Leviathan, and oh, even before Leviathan, I think they had another project uh, before that. Oh, but then they did yeah. they Return of the Living yeah, Dead, they, I think, right. Yes, they also made a book for that one as well. And then they, uh, like you said, now they're doing um, the Dark Ditties, um, which episode three should be arriving this month uh, the, on Amazon Prime. So we'll yeah. see about that. And then they also are finishing RoboDoc, a documentary about RoboCop. They did the You're So Cool Brewster that had uh, Nicholas Vince and Simon Banford play um, some of the host segments in the 
in in the in between the interviews. So <laughs> that's a really cool one. Go check yeah. that one out. Yeah. That is yeah. Cool. Nicholas Vince is a vampire, and Simon Banford is a vampire hunter. Um, yeah. Peter I, Vincent. You know, I still haven't watched that because I haven't seen the movie that it's based on yet. Oh, okay. So you haven't seen the Fright Night movie? No. No, I need to okay. do that. It's a good movie. I think you'll enjoy it. It's probably on Netflix. Yeah, I, between Netflix and Amazon Prime, hopefully I'll be able to find it. So this documentary for Night of the Demons is on Indiegogo uh, for crowdfunding, as usual. They crowdfund most of their documentaries. So, um, yeah, we'll put a link to that on the show notes. And yeah. if you're interested in supporting this and getting a really awesome version of their documentary, because they're so full of, like, insight, interviews, uh, unpublished materials, um, s stuff that you would never know about these documentaries, about these movies, unless you watch the documentary. So go check that out at, on Indiegogo and give them like a, a dollar or two or more, <laughs> you know, just yeah. be a part of it. And you, you may get yourself like I, I did the, uh, the Leviathan one like you did. And we got that three DVD edition of it, which is just amazing. 11 hours of content. So, yeah. um, it's totally worth it guys. Go check it out. Well, yeah, and now we've got people messaging us asking how they can get that three DVD set. You know, on on um, on our Discord chat, we had somebody asking about that, and it's like, yeah, I'm, I don't know. I mean, eBay maybe. I mean, the 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 the, the good ones are on. You know, the 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 complete versions are on their their uh, fundraiser sites because after that, you know, they come packaged with. Like the Leviathan documentary, you can get a one-hour version on some sets and two-hour version on some sets, but not the whole thing. Right. So uh, about the documentary, I'm not sure, but I know for, for a fact you can still get the Leviathan book, I think. Um, <clears throat> they, are, they are actually doing an anniversary sale, and you can get that Leviathan book for $19.99 uh, Great Britain pounds. So oh. it used to be $24.99, but they're doing that – yeah, I think. Let me wow. see if let me see what the date is on this blog post. Because if you go to their website, cultscreenings.co.uk, again, that's cultscreenings.co.uk, yeah. slash Leviathan dash book, uh, you'll be able to to find more information about this. And then Clive, there's a Clive Barker interview, a new one that just came out. It's in on it's on a book in a book called It's Alive from Crystal Lake Publishing. Uh, and I've only just just this morning saw a tweet about it, and so I don't know much more about that. I'll research it a little bit and uh, put some more more information into the show notes before this this goes out. That's fantastic. Um, it's always great to see more uh, Clive Barker interviews, and the Arrow uh, Blu-ray for Candyman does have an amazing interview with Clive there called the divine explicit. And I do recommend people go there and watch it because it's, it's very intimate interview and Clive goes into a lot of stuff about his life, about feeling like an outsider. And I just wanted to put that little note here. Is the arrow Blu-ray is only, uh, is only a region B or whatever, or, or you, um, European region coded. I think so. Yeah. So, uh, and the, and the, um, and then the the Shout Factory one is North American region coded, but doesn't have that interview. So I'm not sure. I don't have that one. Uh, so I would have to look and see what uh, maybe yeah. David can uh, can tell us uh, yeah, what be, the contents are for that one. Yeah, it would be good to see a breakdown of the differences between the two. And I think they're going to be covering that on their upcoming uh, podcast episode, too. Right. So that would be an interesting episode for our listeners to also check out the Cinema Bluster podcast when that episode comes out. Um, yeah. On to our Kickstarter. So the Kickstarter has been kind of going great guns. I mean, I, I, every year I, you know, I always think, you know, is what if people don't 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 donate anything? Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, in our first hour, we hit our not our first hour, but first few hours of the of the Kickstarter, we hit our goal. Uh, to keep us going, the seven hundred dollars that it takes for our hosting and and domain names and and uh, to keep the, the to to the um, hundred dollars developer for, account, yeah, for the developer Apple developer account and that kind of stuff. So uh, all of that we've got covered, and since then we are now up to one thousand two hundred and six dollars, and we've reached. Um, we're gonna we've got we're so we've reached the stretch goals for interview episodes. Aberat one, two, and three discussions, uh, news episodes, 
and uh, news from the reef. So we'll we'll keep doing audio versions of the you know those quick little audio snippets of the news uh, in the uh, in the podcast feed. And uh, that's two, wonderful. And two plays, and uh, audio commentaries for the dark ditties. We just reached that. We're just barely over that. So we may we may have some people join us for those. Uh, that would be fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm excited about that because we we have, um, I think Lori uh, from Simon Bamford fans uh, will probably be joining us to talk about Dark Ditties, either audio commentaries or or when we when the third one comes out, we might do a dedicated episode to that because we haven't we don't finders keepers. We don't know too much about that one. Yeah. Make sure you got uh, Kleenex on hand for when uh, Mrs. Wiltshire, uh, when you watch that with our documentary, there's probably going to be, <laughs> yeah, there's probably going to be some tears on that one. So, yeah, Mrs. Wiltshire, holy crap, that was that was such a good episode, it and was, the yeah. and the offer as well, of course. But yeah. it's just it's different, and t- the theme and the tone are different for those two. Uh, so, mm-hmm. um, very pleasantly surprised with the second one. So let's wait for the Jeep uh, Finders Creepers. I was going to say Jeepers Creepers. Finders um, Keepers. Yeah, interested. Yeah. Finders Keepers. There you go. Um, so the next stretch goal is comics, the Harrowers discussion. So you remember the Gene Colan uh, artwork um, uh, for the Harrowers that cr- started out in the Hellraiser comic book uh, published by Marvel in the 90s. Uh, we actually have those. They were, how many came out? Was it six comic books or something? Uh, I, I forgot I think, if it was yeah. six or 10. I, I think it was six too, but now I can't remember. Yeah. I think you're right though. I think it was six. That was an interesting expansion to the Hellraiser universe. And even though we might've mentioned these comics before, it'll be a, a, a fun revisitation and uh, a more in-depth analysis of of the stories in there. So yeah. there was a lot of cool stuff they came up with. Yeah, and you know, at first I was thinking, did we do these already? But we really only talked about the Harrower stories from the Hellraiser comics, and right. we, uh, we uh, haven't really gone into these yet. So the issues nineteen and twenty, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I'm looking forward to that. It's a spin-off comic. Uh, from Hellraiser right at the time that Hellraiser was kind of shutting down. And then the next ones will be uh, The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina on Netflix. As you know, it has artwork by Clive Barker in the, uh, what do you call it, The School? Um, yeah, yeah. The, the School of Magic. Mm-hmm. And I haven't seen the pilot episode yet, but I'm uh, I'm probably going to watch it this weekend. Uh, just get acquainted with the show. I've seen the trailer. I've seen the teasers. I've read about it, but I haven't seen the show yet. So yeah. I've been watching other stuff on Netflix. Um, I don't know. Have you been? What have you been watching on Netflix recently? Oh, yeah. I have watched, you had time to watch anything? Yeah, I've been watching. I watched all of the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, and I watched um, The oh. Haunting of Hill House. Oh, you did? That yeah. was a really cool show. Yeah, oh, I, I wow. really liked that. Um, I saw that show by myself in the dark at night. And, and me too. Uh, <laughs> I did too. Yeah. yeah. I binged it in like two or three days, and I was like, oh, wow, this this was really, really uh, amazing. Even though you've seen this so many times, like, oh, yeah, family with kids moves into a haunted house, and then there's yeah. you know the little girl that's super sensitive, and there's a little boy and talks to ghosts. And it's like, but they did it in such a refreshing way that uh worked so well for me and i thought th- there were some crazy like one shot sequences where the camera is just rolling around and then i saw this video on youtube of how they did certain shots so it's like when the camera turns around immediately a bunch of guys come into the set move things around other actors leave and other actors come in and stand in a different place and then the camera rotates and then you see that and you're wondering how do they do that and uh, yeah, that's that's how they do it. Yeah, one shot, crazy stuff. Yeah, yeah. I really, I, I'd, I'd want to talk about it more. I mean, it's, it's. We might, we might talk about it more because the haunting of Hill House, the the movie, and the Shirley Jackson book were we're talked we're talked about in Clyde Barker's A to Z of horror. Um, so this is kind of spun off of that, but um. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it was a it was a really cool show, and I'd like to talk about it more, maybe episode by episode at some point because it was so cool. And there's a lot of you know, I don't want to get spoilery with it, though. Yeah, 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 no, I agree. 
Yeah, and it's hard yeah. to talk about all the cool revelations and stuff in in that show without, you know, oh, spoiling it. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, this is not a Netflix podcast, but another thing I'm really curious about is the Coen Brothers, um, The Ballad of Buster Skuggs. That right. seems like a really good show. I've heard about that, but yeah, that that would be a good yeah. one to watch, too. So another one of the stretch goals that we have on the Kickstarter is to make an audio commentary for The Last Movie Star, which was one of Burt Reynolds' last movies, if not yeah. the last one, right? Um, I I like the way you put it here. It says with Burt Reynolds and a jacket by Clive Barker. (laughs) I'm just imagining Burt Reynolds talking to a jacket on a chair, the whole movie. (laughs) Right. Right. And in a, in a jacket with, I gave a, I gave a a leather jacket billing over Chevy chase. (laughs) (laughs) Oh boy. And then of course, uh, we are the Clive Barker podcast. So, you know, and I, I, I imagine Chevy chase was hard to work with. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I heard his uh, Wally co-star got punched in the face. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> that was a reference to the vacation movie. Oh. Anyway, so uh, the stretch goal that we have, uh, one of our last stretch goals is the uh, Duels of Blood, Volume 4. That's going to be yeah. a Nightbreed one, right? Mm-hmm. So we'll reach that if we uh, if we make 1400 on the Kickstarter. And then, of course, we still have the interview book that we're working on um, that you can still uh, apply to buy a copy of that. So yeah. and, and going, we'll back, probably... going back to stretch goals really quick, I, I'm thinking I want to add another one. Uh, there are so many more. We, we've done projects that never were, and there are so many more projects that we're starting to learn about, you know, just through research and stuff that um, scripts and things that we can talk about. So I think that would be a good way to go um, for more stretch. Goals. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We could discuss like the mo- the mummy that uh, Clyde Barker worked on for a while and that ended up just becoming the Brendan Fraser, the mummy. Uh, yeah. But but he worked on that one for a while. And, well, yeah. and so there was a treatment. Uh, I don't think we ever really discussed the treatment. And uh, so we 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 were told some stuff about it. So now we know a little more about what it was like. And that's one of the examples that we can talk about in a future episode. So if you're interested in some of those projects that never were, um, yeah, we may we may be able to get more information about those. Yeah, yeah. And just so many, so many projects that that, uh, you know, didn't get off the ground, unfortunately. Yep. Um, But yeah. And so you were just talking about the interview book. we are, you know, we're we're waiting. We've got some some uh, friends of the podcast are are working on transcribing some more episodes for us, and we're in the middle of transcribing some episodes. And once that's done, I think that it'll really, you know, the process will really kind of pick up from there because then then it's just editing and formatting and and uh, printing. Yeah, and we may have some more rewards coming in because, for example. Uh, Friend of the podcast and uh, writer extraordinaire Peter Atkins, uh, he supported our last Kickstarter, and he's sent some stuff for this Kickstarter as well, right? Yeah, yeah. He said uh, he was putting that in the mail today. So we'll have we'll have some more stuff that's autographed by Peter Atkins uh, coming this way. So I'm really looking forward to that. What? That's super cool. Yeah. Um, and you can listen to him uh, talking to us on episode 106. Uh, so. Make sure you install the BarkerCast app. Someone yes. has to install it. Come on. Yeah, yeah. we've got it on, I just, on iOS and Android. Um, I just bought a new stores. phone on Thanksgiving, and one of the first things I did was I installed my BarkerCast app on it Woo-hoo. from Google Play Yay. because it, it's such a neat little app. I love it. I love the work that went into it. I love the way that it was developed, and it's something that you guys helped create, so you guys should also uh, take advantage of it. Yeah, and and it's also there if you know somebody and you want to, you know, that's a Clive Barker fan, but maybe they don't listen to podcasts or they're not super familiar with the concept of podcasts. All they have to do is download an app and they can listen to stuff. They don't have to get a podcatcher app and figure out how to find it and subscribe and all that. They can just, it's just all right there in the app. It's so easy. It's so easy to find our podcast nowadays because... 
Uh, we're also on. Uh, we're, we used to be on Stitcher, right? Is that still something that exists? Yeah, yeah, we're on. We're still on Stitcher, and we're also now okay. on Spotify, which we weren't. Spotify. Before. Yeah. And yeah, so and you can listen to your music, and then you can listen to an episode of our podcast, and uh, send us a line saying, "Hey, I disagree with what you said," or <laughs> "Hey, how about you cover this in a future episode?" So yeah. go ahead and do that. We're um, we're also going to be in Pandora here pretty soon. I'm I'm working. Oh, that's it. neat. I didn't know Pandora had, had podcasts. Just, uh, I haven't used it in a while, I have to admit. They're just now starting podcasts. And so um, Libsyn that we work with for our hosting is rolling out um, podcasts. And and also I think they just started a new destination for a new uh, a new thing for Radio Public. So I think we can get in there, too. There you go. As soon as yeah. we know uh, more about that Pandora thing, it's it's going to go on our um, website yeah. and make a blog about it. So, yeah. yeah. So I'm totally looking forward to that because you know the more more places the better. We want to split spread our uh, love of Clive Barker's work and related work. Um, of course. Yeah. And just shoot the shit together here because we <laughs> yeah. love talking we love talking every week on the phone and uh, the more people the merrier you know we hope to to get uh david sharp and marcus williams and rob right to join us in more future episodes and yeah. maybe even more people more guests more listeners that would yeah. be always tremendous you can always send us more feedback just click that little voicemail tab on the side of our website if you're looking at it on your phone you can send a voicemail and and i think it goes to your account right ryan yeah, yeah, um, that's right. Yeah, and then uh, and and actually, we'll have one that will be there's a there's one that didn't quite make it for the episode two hundred that we'll be kind of adding on to here that we'll talk we'll get to in a minute. But um, yeah, and then as far as so going back to the Kickstarter, um, if you will, if you want to just support us without any um, without any rewards, you can do that, and you'll we'll thank you of course on this podcast and on our blog. Uh, social media and stuff but you can also we also still have quite a bit of stuff left that you can kind of that you can get as backer rewards through this podcast i mean through this kickstarter so we got um nail wraps are still there uh magica cards um stickers with the cabal inkblot face you know which would, that would be a really cool thing to have uh candy man pins that's the one with a, a little b and he's got a hook for a stinger um, we've got Screaming Skull button pins, uh, Hellraiser pinhead patches. We've got uh, the greeting card sets, which are kind of hilarious. We had um, we now that I've now that I've taken a look at the, what's inside of them, you know, because it's a set of five cards. Um, we've got the Thief of Always journal set. We still have uh, we still have that um, Thief of Always pin set. Pinhead button pins. We've got iPhone cases for if you have an iPhone 7. Uh, we've got a bunch of tote bags uh, still available. We have posters for Razor Line and the Imagica card set and the Nightbreed Director's Cut. And uh, we've got a lot of Do Not Trust the Smiling World posters. If you want a, a poster like you were just talking about earlier with that right. ske sketch and the, and the Clive Barker quote. Uh, those are smaller mm -hmm. posters, so they don't take up a huge amount of space on your wall. Uh, maybe you can even hang it up in your at your work, <laughs> but but that's a really cool poster. Yeah, I was thinking of hey, hanging off. that up in my cubicle. Yeah, right. So this is a great way to get some uh, some rare Clyde Barker material and the collectibles, and um, you know, it's it, it, you're helping you're helping us stay on, up on the air and. Um, that's really the whole point of this is to be able to make more material, make more episodes so you can enjoy them and uh, and we can continue to spread the word about Clyde Barker's work. And we also have uh, Terry Cat leggings, um, best Cutler gallery posters. Um, oh, our, our T-shirt, our, our Barker cast T-shirt. You can get that. Uh, it's the, the one from our first our, our first. Um, design event. yeah our first design yeah thank you so um that was our most popular design and we brought that one back uh in black with white uh with a, the white design on it 
Um, of course, the interview book that we just talked about, um, we really hope that more people will buy that. And um, you can plan an episode with us. We've got one person that's already done that. And you can advertise with us for 6, 14, or 24 episodes. I just want to bring up uh, the the Best Cutler Gallery poster. Mm -hmm. uh, the picture that you use for it is autographed, and the ones you're selling, are, the ones that are in the Kickstarter are not autographed, right? Right. Yeah, they're also not yeah. personalized to Ryan very best wishes. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. No, it, that's it was, it just was the easiest one that's to take, hanging on your wall. To take a picture of the one that's hanging on my wall. But I have more of right. those. I, I, I bought a... A long time ago, I bought this. This it was like in the late '90s, right when eBay first started. I found some some dealer that was getting out of the business of selling stuff, and he had what he called a Clive Barker grab bag. And so I got like 30 of each of these different kinds of posters. So that one, and the um, and the um, razor line posters, and the Imagica trading card um, posters. I got a bunch of those. So, I mean, right now I don't have quite so many, you know, there's like five, Lucky you. five to 10 of each left, but, but yeah, I, I thought that was pretty cool. And, you know, they've been, uh, they've been serving our, our, uh, Kickstarters for, for three years or so now. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, sometimes it like that guy that you once mentioned, uh, someone had a warehouse full of, um, uh, the tribe plushies. <laughs> yeah. The jump tribe. Jump tribe, yeah. So sometimes these things will just surface, and uh, you know, if you're lucky enough to grab them, then you have a lot of those that you can uh, share with friends or sell or whatever. So yeah, that's always fun. Yeah. So we're at 25 days, you know, left. So we still have plenty of time. Um, we got a lot of cool stuff left to buy. Uh, we had four cabal cuts, and those have all been uh, spoken for, of course. Um, and we try to give people as much notice as possible, but uh, you know, some I'm, I'm sure there's going to be some people that missed out on that. And um, that's really oh um, yeah, I think we discussed that's everything with this with the Kickstarter. Just go over to Kickstarter and search for Clive Barker or Clive Barker Podcast or you know something like that. Um, we'll have a link here in the show notes too, and it's on the website and it's all over our Facebook and Twitter. So, yeah, go check it out. Help us out. Keep the Barker cast alive and on the air, and um, we'll do the best we can to continue providing interesting content, especially with, you know, special features, bringing you uh, trivia and insight into certain projects that never got made, uh, bringing you behind-the-scenes information that we may still have here stored uh, in our notes from when, you know, we were still pretty much in contact with Seraphin. Uh, last year and stuff. So uh, yeah, we still have lots of stuff that we can bring out, and uh, and 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 produce some interesting content for you guys. And of course, we'll keep discussing new things as they as they come out. Yep, that's true. So, yeah. and this Kickstarter having no beginning will end in <laughs> twenty five days. So please go there and contribute. Yeah, yeah. So the next thing we wanted to talk about was Hellraiser: The Toll, the audiobook version. So th for me, this was my first time revisiting this book since we got the uh, the advanced reader copy. Right. And so I was experiencing the differences between this and the advanced reader copy in in um, for the first time in this audio podcast, audio not podcast, audio um, drama book. version of the of the book. Yeah. Audio book. I mean, it's not like. Yeah, so it, 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 it's just an audio book, um, so it does have different voices for different characters, it but it's not as elaborate a production as, like, Baffle Gab's uh, Hellbound Heart, right? Well, I think it's still an audio drama because it has a cast and it has sound effects and music. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, I would I would call it an audio drama. It, I mean, it's also an audio book, too, Um yeah, it's on. It, you can get it on Audible right now, so you can either subscribe to their service or you can just buy it from them. Right, so you can go there and look up an Audible, audible dot com. Uh, you'll find Hellraiser: The Toll audiobook, and it is narrated by Tom Holland. Yes, yeah. that Tom Holland uh, from the store Terror Time and from all the special effects work that he's done. Right, and uh, not Tom Holland that played Spider Man. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's like what one hour, hour thirty six minutes. Like the book itself was pretty short. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah, you can listen to it like listening to a podcast episode. Basically, yeah, it's only just an hour and thirty six minutes. It has uh, Malie, yeah, it's Malie the unabridged Elf. version. It has Malie Elfman as Kirsty Cotton, um, Peter Atkins, you know the the writer for Hellbound, and Hellraiser three and Hellraiser four, uh, as Doctor Joseph Lansing. Um, and uh, it has uh, Joshua Holland as Frank Cotton. Mm -hmm. And then it's got Casey Lansdale as uh, Miss Pryor, who's the teacher that uh, Kirsty writes the letter to God mm -hmm. uh, in the book. And then she also plays a secretary, a stewardess, and then she plays Madame Rambert, uh, yeah. if you remember that. When she goes to Devil Island, there's a little hotel there, and she's the lady that owns the hotel. Yeah. Um, Robert Parigi plays Walter, the kind of the butler of the hotel. And uh, we have... Uh, the same person who was uh, Pinhead at Monster Palooza, yeah. that one time when they uh, made a, you know, a live uh, recreation of of Pinhead, uh, Christian Francis, uh, yeah. he's in this book as the Cold Man. Um, yeah. So, I'm yeah. glad they got a, a British person to play this because they got that accent right uh, with the Doug Bradley accent, of course. But uh, very, very good, good, good performances from everybody here. Yeah. And, and I, I particularly for this for this book, I like that he's he's titled the Cold Man, which is Kirsty's uh, Kirsty's name for him. You know, for yeah, me. yeah, really cool. She does she does insult him at one point with that particular word, but uh, it's like the Scarlet Gospels. He does not like to be called Pinhead, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And if uh, you do that, you're gonna get a chain up your butt. <laughs> right. We get. Richard Ankles as the run, the runner, and, uh -huh. and uh, of course Richard Ankles is an is a, a pseudonym for um, Andrew Furtado, who's been on our podcast before, and and uh, people might know him as uh, the editor for Nightbreed, the director's cut. That's right, and I think he also edited this particular production. So, uh, Richard Ankles or <laughs> Dick Ankles. Um, and I think that name came from a, a previous short film that Mark Miller did, and uh, that was the name of his character in that movie. Uh, so <laughs> that's funny. Uh, you got me, Furtado. <laughs> uh, he plays the runner. So if, if you read the book, you know who the runner is. He's the kind of the demonic entity that Kirsty sees over at Ludovico Street. Um, yeah. And Justin Von Der Ack plays Hans, so yeah. the character in the book. So um my thoughts about the book was that it's it's a it's a very nice production. The performances were great. My only concern was that uh, Tom Holland's narration was just a little heavy, uh, uh, in in the sense that his um, his delivery of the narration is uh, it it it's a little heavy in the sense that uh, he kind of goes on and doesn't really have a lot of variety in his expression. But then as the book progresses, he starts to make a little more. Uh, he starts to become a little more emotional when he narrates here and there. So yeah. that he's, quickly becomes more warm and uh, more rich. He's got kind of a gruff voice that you're not used to hearing for narration in an audio book. So he's like, Devil Island. <laughs> That's right. Sometimes it seems like he, uh, when he's saying, like ending a sentence, and he, he does kind of that growl like, you know, Devil Island, uh, and it's like, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that was interesting, but, yeah. um, right, so, in Audible, you can buy at regular price, six ninety five for Hellraiser the Toll, and if you're, if you're an Amazon Prime uh, customer, I believe you can get it, uh, a free trial for Audible, and, uh, you can also listen to it that way, you can cancel it after 30 days and you can go in and listen to it. But I do advise you to, you know, recommend that you go there and you pay the price for it because that will really help, you know, cover the cost for the production and all that. And it's a it's a good book and it's a good story. So I, I think you can try listening to it for free, but I do recommend uh, supporting the people who did this. The one thing that I really liked about it, too, was the, the music by uh, Chris Velasco, Um you might recognize that name. He's been on our podcast before. He did the music for um, Clive Barker's Jericho. So anybody that played that game on like PC or or um, Xbox 360 or PlayStation 3, if you remember 
uh, Clive Barker's Jericho. He did the music for that. So now he's done the music for this audio drama, audio production. And God of War, one through right. three, you know. Right, yeah. Uh, big thing there, God of yeah. War. Um, uh, so Dark, yeah, Chris Dark Velasco. Darksiders, too. He's done the music for Darksiders 1 and 2, and he's working on the music for upcoming Darksiders 3. Right. We did a hangout uh, with him once, and that ended up being episode number 127. So if you want to go back and listen to that, we talk about his work with Jericho and uh, and uh, pretty much go through his career really quickly and, and just talk about uh, – different aspects of how he composes music and what sort of direction he was given for some of that stuff. So go listen to episode 127. Uh, it's got Chris Velasco in there as well. I really liked the casting on this, except there was one thing that kind of bugged me and I, maybe, yeah. maybe I'm wrong here or maybe I missed something, but the, um, Madame Rambert, right. She's supposed to be a French person, isn't she? Well, it does seem that way, right? It's Devil's Island, French Guiana, and yeah. uh, her name is Rambert. Uh, in my reading of the book, I did imagine that she would be like a French lady, yes. I did too. I mean, I, it's fine if she speaks English and or even if she speaks perfect English. But she had a southern accent, and that kept <laughs> that kept throwing me off and pulling me out of the book. I'm like, why does this lady have a southern accent? How did she get here? She could be from Louisiana, for all I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, right? yeah, maybe. I guess that could be, but it she, seems like she's a long way from home. And and yeah. the, the um, Devil's Island was being kept up by the French government. Right, right. So I, I do see your point there. Um, well, I guess it was a choice. Um, yeah. They wanted her to have some sort of accent, I guess, instead of trying to imitate a hokey version of a – of a French accent, like, oh, bonjour, monsieur, yeah, how are you right. doing? Right. I guess they just went with a southern accent because it probably was easier for them, for the performers. Right. So, yeah. Right. Actually, that reminds me. I've been meaning to ask you. Uh, your, your, uh, your English has an American accent, right? But you, but you. Right. But you, did you, so where did that come from? I mean, why, why American instead of like, instead of like UK, British English accent? That's, that's a good question. Um, there are some people in Portugal that do learn English with a British accent. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my case, I guess I was more exposed to American entertainment. Oh, so okay. that's probably what shaped my accent. I mean, we did get lots of TV shows as well from England. And I could I could turn it on and off if I want. It's mm -hmm. just that I I just I feel like if I try to push myself to have a British accent, it comes off as kind of hokey, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Whereas the American accent is more relaxed, uh, if that makes any sense. Uh, the British one is a little more formal. And then of course there's, you know, what sort of British accent? What is the British accent? Because there's British accent from you know Liverpool. There's British yeah. accent from. Uh, Manchester, there's there's Irish, there's Scottish, yeah. and there's London, which is a really posh one. And um, so there's a lot of variety to that. And then if you get that accent from TV, then you're going to get something that's kind of a mix of everything. So I guess I, I always became more um, immersed in American entertainment when it comes to the particular accent. Um, yeah. And then it's just the people that I've talked to, you know, over the years. I mean, they've always been more american than british yeah so in that sense that's kind of what i adapted into well and, and yours is more for american it's not like southern or 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 um or east you know east coast or or like um i mean yours is kind of more like what you'd hear in the news you know it's more like like how i talk also um, it's funny west because coast i read of. an article yeah i read an article once that says that um there's something called the – what's it called? The uh, Atlantic or whatever it's called, the Atlantic ac accent, which is something that was never really from a location. It was more like from movies and TV shows, oh, how the actors yeah. would speak, right? Yeah, I, I know don't what know you if mean. you know it's what I'm like, talking about. Yeah, it's like uh, – it's this this weird sort of way of talking that, that doesn't really exist anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's an interesting uh, point. So – Another performance I really liked in this audiobook was uh, Peter Atkins as yeah. uh, Dr. Lansing. Yeah. He plays that uh, that guy that sends Kirsty a letter and uh, gets the whole ball 
you know, rolling for this uh, situation where she she gets sucked back into the events of Ludovico Street, right? She, uh, uh, without any spoilers, that's that's what kind of she's in hiding, right? She's in hiding from the gulfs. She's she's been hiding from hell for uh, decades, and um, and she um, she's become co quite a adept at uh, making herself invisible to hell and uh, she has several identities and uh, several uh, houses around Europe and for some reason this guy manages to track her down and send her a letter and so Pete did a great job here Dr. Joseph Lansing um, very very expressive uh, a lovely uh, narration of the letter so I was very happy to see Peter Atkins do this that was yeah. a, a really cool cameo thanks yeah. Pete yeah that was awesome so that that was um so yeah I I totally recommend getting this audiobook also and you know I think that um I think that it's a nice little sort of prequel story that ties in ties you into the Scarlet Gospels. Right, that's right. Yes, the Scarlet Gospels. Um Damore was going to be the first witness, but before Damore there was another. Yeah. <laughs> so if you remember the Scarlet Gospels, uh, the the hell priest wanted a witness to write his Scarlet Gospels, right? The adventure that he was going to go on to change heaven and hell. Um, and Damore turns out was his second choice. Uh, the first yeah. choice was Kirsty, of course. So, and and Mally Elfman as Kirsty Cotton, she has a, a heck of a performance as well. She uh, she does a great job. Um, the conversation, the confrontation between her and the cold man at the end, it's uh, really fantastic. Something to hear. I just thought that sometimes uh, Tom Holland's narration kind of butts into their dialogue. <laughs> yeah, right, which, which is and, normal when you're reading a book, but when you when you hear it, yeah. you're like, whoa. Yeah. So like she says something, and then cuts to Tom Holland talking. Uh, she looked at him and this and this and that. And then it's like, we have eternity to know your flesh. And then it's like, and he walked slowly around. And, and it's, I don't know. Yeah. It just, I, I felt like that part. Yeah. The, the problem is that there's insight in that narration between what's going on that needs to be there. You can't just have the dialogue be just like in, uninterrupted. But at the same time, I thought that the way that he talks kind of interrupted yeah. the immersion into the yeah. dialogue between uh, Kirsty and Pinhead, but uh, Said a small complaint. Around. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a small complaint there, yeah. but uh, uh, Tom Holland could have been a little better. But that's that's just my opinion. Yeah, yeah, but it's interesting to see him. He's kind of a horror icon uh, in his own right. It was it was neat to see to see him as kind of the narrator as as a as a sort of cameo in there. Not a cameo, but he's the, he's the narrator. But you know, it's it's a I don't know. It's kind of a neat neat idea. Yep. And Tom Holland, just to make a, a elliptical connection to something we talked about in the beginning, he actually worked in Child's Play and Fright Night. So um, I'm sure there was an interview with him somewhere in the uh, uh, the Fright Night documentary from Dead Mouse Productions. So oh, he's yeah? probably there as well. Yeah. So. Very interesting audiobook. It's uh, it's been a while since this book has been out, and it was originally um, it was released recently uh, on November, so November six, I believe, on Audible. So go check it out. It's under the category mysteries and thrillers, and then the subcategory supernatural and paranormal. All right. Yeah. Um, so on the site, uh, we, uh, Rob had been working on this article for quite a while and it's, he kind of surprised us. Now it's, it's finished as of yesterday, I believe, uh, Barker cast presents the original cut of Hellraiser bloodline does exist. And it, it kind of spark was sparked by our Texas Frightmare, uh, weekend interview with, um, with Kevin Yeager. Kevin Yeager. Yeah. And uh, and then and and uh, and kind of goes into more detail, I think, from email conversations that he's been having on, you know, the differences. And, and some people were getting confused in, in our in our Facebook comments. But the differences between what Kevin Yeager had, what he presented to producers and stuff versus this um, this work print cut that kind of circulated in the in the late 90s. Right. On VHS. 
Right. So, of course, we we knew to some extent that I'm sure that Kevin Yeager has lots of material. He was selling some props from Hellraiser Bloodline on his website uh, not too long ago. So yeah. he must have a, an enormous amount of stuff from when he worked on that movie. And um, that work print that's been going around on the Internet for Hellraiser Bloodline, that is not one of his cuts because that has stuff that was already rewritten by Randy Rand Ravage mm -hmm. and uh, shot by uh, Joe Chappelle. So you could tell that that was a later producer's cut uh, from uh, Hellraiser Bloodline that was still incomplete, misses VFX shots and all that stuff. Um, his stuff didn't have stuff like his cuts didn't have anything like the holographic priest. Cause there was one time when John merchant, the future John merchant is on board the Mino space station. And he has this conversation like, uh, with the holographic priest on, on like some sort of holodeck. Yeah. And, uh, he's asking for strength and forgiveness for what he must do. He must summon the demon pinhead to confront him. And, that is not in the original script. That was not Peter Atkins's material. That was rewritten oh. uh, uh, later stage when they were doing reshoots. Um, so stuff like that is in the work print that is rolling around. So I'm curious to know what, you know, uh, Kevin Yeager's cuts have that that work print doesn't. And one of the things that Rob mentions is that uh, there is more of the past segment apparently. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So the the the, the part with the clowns and. And, um, yeah. and yeah, so and and um, D was his name uh, not D D Lille. Who is the the other guy that was? Um, I'm trying to think. The the, the Jacques. One, Jacques, yeah. So he instead of getting stabbed to death, right, he rapidly ages when she takes her her magic away that was keeping him alive. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So all of that yeah. stuff, I think that would be really cool. It would be really nice to see kind of a a big special edition. You know, like I think Rob was calling for this in his article, but I agreed, you know, to see a big special edition definitive uh, Hellraiser 4 that has, you know, the theatrical cut, of course, because you need that because it, it's complete. But but mm -hmm. also the also this this version would be nice. It would. I just think it would need so much work and, and, and scenes that were never shot that it would be almost impossible in my opinion to, to complete it as he intended it. Um, cause you, you know, you'd have to bring back pinhead. You'd have to, uh, get someone to pay for like, uh, special effects. There might be pickup shots that were never done yeah. or second unit shots that were never done. So well, at this point, how would they do it? You know, I, they, I could, they could even just put in, um, scenes from the from the um what do you call that the the drawings you know like i can't think uh, of the word sure but usually they, they nobody wants that's like a, a, a that's like a compromised uh solution right so that's that yeah. that doesn't make anybody happy it would make them happy in the sense that it would be out there um yeah well, but i, mean, I don't think the director are, will be happy with you, that what else are you gonna do i mean you can't Right, and it's not a director's cut because his name's not even on the on the movie. Right, I mean he cut that movie uh, when he was still working on it, so theoretically you could call it a director's cut, but more like a, a, a director's work print, right? Yeah, yeah, and it would be on there as a special feature. You know, yeah, uh, it could be there as an extra. Yeah, right, that would be right. that would be great. The main the uh, main film was still going to be the theatrical cut because that's the one that's finished. Yeah, but so who would work on the actual movie <laughs> that that would be an extra to, right? Uh, so shout, are you say Shout Factory or somebody who had to have a financial interest in it getting done, I think. Yeah, but there has to be someone behind it with either a producer or a director of the original movie. Um, otherwise, it's just going to be a fan cut that someone's going to make for Shout Factory, right? Yeah. And I don't think Kevin Yeager is interested in revisiting the movie um, to edit something that has stuff he didn't make. So, uh, yeah, that's just the problem that I see here is that it's one of those movies. It's it's an Alan Smithy film. Um, neither Joe Chappelle nor Kevin Yeager wanted their name on it. Um, and so it would be great to see these work prints or uh, work print cuts as an extra to like a new edition of Bloodline. But I, I'm not sure if they would be able to make a 
a new version of Bloodline because who would work on that? So that's that's my question. So well, if he um, owned, it would if have he... to be probably the theatrical cut and then have an extra for that, the work print. Right, and he, they just you just take the what he's got and you put it on you you know you put it in di- in a digital form. Yeah, as an extra. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. It's it's a problem film. It's a problem film. It's yeah. there is no easy solution for an Alan Smithy film, right? There is no yeah. there is no easy way of getting out of. The, the the compromised version that it ended up being. Even if you bring up work prints, um, again, who's going to put that in there? Who's going to do it? It has to be someone with a vision connected to the film. Uh, or you just make the choice of releasing the theatrical print, uh, rescanned or restored to like 2K or something, if that's even available. Well, you know, um, I think that everybody that was in, the people that were involved in that movie, there's been enough time gone by and enough bad Hellraiser sequels you know, to where it's like, I think that there are people out there that would really want to see this and, and that they'll recognize that, hey, you know, compared to Hellraiser Revelations, this one's not that bad, you know, and all the people that wanted to distance <laughs> yeah. themselves from it or were embarrassed by it. It's like, uh-huh. you know, actually, I, it seems like the fans are, are really liking this. Maybe it's worth revisiting. Right. But. But who is going to do that? I Again, like I said, Kevin Yeager, I don't think he wants to work on this movie anymore. Well, uh, he, he said he would, if, he would if, be consider putting it on YouTube. Oh, well, well, that's interesting. Um, that would be an interesting choice for sure. Yeah, I would totally watch that. And um, yeah, because there's stuff here that never made it to that particular work print. I'm sure there were plenty of work prints um, done before. You know, that that's not the only work print that exists, the one that's leaked on the Internet. Um, I'm sure there, there was different cuts uh, that he showed to producers himself. I remember uh, Rob goes into quick uh, detail about those here. He says that they varied between 110 minutes to, you know, maybe 80 something minutes. So and, and there was lots of stuff that was still missing from them. So yeah. they're not complete movies. Uh, you'd have these cue cards in saying insert effects here or yeah. uh, chains come out of here or, you know, put these effects there. And then there's sequences probably that were never filmed. Um, but it would still be amazing to see that material come up and uh, become an extra for a Bloodline re-release at some point. Yeah. Yeah, I, totally. I think that I think that that movie, I mean, is it even can you even buy it? on its own on blu-ray i don't think so i think it's only in like compilations and stuff in high definition i think there is a blu-ray isn't there i don't know let me look let me look it up real quick yeah you can buy a whole razor bloodline uh as a blu-ray yeah hmm. okay. you can it came out it came out in 2011 on blu-ray all right well, a more definitive set would still be kind of nice and people giving it proper, you know, instead of just putting it out there as a placeholder, giving it a proper, like, definitive edition. I agree. Yeah. Um, so we had some feedback. Uh, this one, we've got a voicemail from Sorka, Sorka Nilane, if you remember her from our, our, uh, our, our episode 201. Uh, she, we talked to her about her book, Dark Imaginer. Uh, she also wanted to leave us some feedback for episode 200. Um, but we, we got our wires crossed a little bit. And so that came in after we were done editing and after we put that movie or that podcast in. So, so here's that. Hi guys, this is Sir Line. Uh, just emailing you or messaging you to congratulate you on your 200th episode coming up. Uh, what a fantastic achievement that is and a landmark, of course, in the podcast world. Um, I just wanted to send you this message to say I look forward to later on in the series, having a chat with you guys later on in the series. And also to say that, obviously, with Halloween coming up, I will most certainly be indulging in my Clive, my love for Clive Barker um, by probably re-watching um, Hellraiser and Hellraiser 2 Hellbound. Um, so congratulations again. Have a wonderful, happy Halloween. And uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. And that, that was really nice of her. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sorka. <laughs> it, was, it was a great pleasure to have her there. Uh, and talk about the Dark Imaginer book, which is still out for sale. So go ahead and try to track down the Dark Imaginer. Um, yeah. 
go check out our previous episode where we talked to her and we'll have links for that in the show notes. Yep. And it's from Manchester University Press. And um, so Robert Rogers, uh, this was talking about uh, Candyman or. No, he was talking about uh, Robert's or uh, Rob Reidenauer's article about um, about Hellraiser Bloodline? Bloodline. Yeah, he said Arrow Films would be a great choice, too, for a release. Um, yeah, that would be nice. And uh, and then Morris Campbell said, when will Clive put out a new novel for adults? Some horror or fantasy, maybe a new horror collection or novel or something. So we don't know, you know, um, Scarlet Gospels was the last one, the last one like that, that was in, uh, 2014, I think. And mm-hmm. then, and mm-hmm. then we had tonight again, uh, in 2015, I believe. Well, you always wonder when someone says, when is something new coming out? Uh, you always have to wonder, well, what have you been buying? Because there's been a lots of stuff that came out since we started making the podcast. There's been yeah. so many releases. You know, you have um, you have the play scripts that are coming out from the Clive Barker archive. Com- absolutely recommended. Yeah. Uh, you have, like you said, uh, you know, tonight again. There was the uh, the book about the characters from the Tortured Souls, yeah. the Tortured Souls book. Um, there's been there's been a bunch of releases, right? I mean, yeah. usually stuff that was already written um, or stuff that was republished with more stuff and more insight on it and more essays around it and stuff. So you always have to wonder, do you know about those other books? If not, track them down because they're out there. It's just that they came out in such limited numbers that I think a lot of fans out there aren't really aware that some of these books came out. And Hellraiser the Toll, I mean, we we didn't we didn't spend a lot of time talking about this but it was adapted from something that clive barker wrote so there's there's a lot of clive barker right. in, in, in that as well um, yes yes so um it, it it was based on a short story that clive barker uh kind of sprouted out of his original idea for the scarlet gospels called heaven's reply and we've we've talked about this um uh, on the podcast before, yeah. but then that a heaven's reply also was used by Clive to make this idea for a Hellraiser remake that was going to take place on devil's Island. Um, so it, you know, this stuff just kind of changes and changes yeah. and changes and becomes something else down the line. And uh, that's just the organic way that Clive Barker works. And they also use the, the, the title heaven's reply, uh, for, for a series of the, of the boom studios, Hellraiser comics. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we have, let's see. Oh, Matthew said, happy holidays. My pockets have been empty all my life, but my nightmares and dreams keep me going. Thank you. So he was talking, that was in response to our Kickstarter. And what I'd say to that is we just, we're just happy to, to talk with you guys. You know, it, it, sometimes, sometimes we, we do these things and we put them out there and people click the like button. Mm-hmm. But I, I like it so much more when people respond and talk to us and give us their feedback. And what do you think? And what would you like to see? You know, and what would you like to us to change? That kind of stuff. Yeah. It's through discussion that we come up with insight and analysis. If we don't have discussion, then you're just reading you're just reading a piece of paper. Um, yeah. And, you know, you're just talking about your opinion. Uh, it, it gets more interesting the more people are in here when you get feedback to talk about stuff and uh, – so, and I just want to go back to to Morris Campbell that you mentioned before, um, to the Twitter announcement, right? That Clyde Barker has new projects that he's about to to release some information about. So I would wait until we know more about that. And it yeah. seems like he might be putting out some new new news soon. So uh, stay tuned for that. Yeah, and and now the real Clive Barker store is gone, but I think that uh, I think that the um, Clive Barker archive is going to be kind of picking up the slack, and and there you will be seeing more releases right. com- coming out that way. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I understand, man. Your pocket's been empty all your life, but your ni- nightmares and dreams keep you going. Yeah. Um, we don't ask for much either for the Kickstarter. I mean. The, this is an opportunity for people to grab some stuff that is pretty rare and collectible. Yeah. Uh, if you want to get those, you know, that's great. You know, I understand being a Clive Barker collector. But if everyone that listens to us gave us one dollar, 
that would immediately cover all our expenses and <laughs> yes. and probably get us to the point where we are right now. So uh, just keep that in mind. Like just one dollar every year, if everybody who listens to us give us that, we'd be set. You know, we we'd be able to go over to Chicago and then talk to Clive and go to Atlanta and visit Clive probably because we have thousands and thousands of clicks and listens every month. So we do have some good insights on our podcast and they're getting better every year. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, we, we've been thinking about changing up the format to this too, because a lot of podcasts don't do Kickstarter. They do like Patreon, but I think this has been kind of nice. It's something that sets us apart. You know, we, we do, we do things differently mainly because we don't know any better, uh, but but the, the Kickstarter has, <laughs> has been really good, and actually, they really appreciate us. They put us on their um, they put us on projects their... we love. Yeah, yeah. It was just for one day, but I thought that was really neat. You know, they, yeah, they projects kind of, we love. They kind of look forward to that, and they like that we read that we do this every year. And the Patreon, psychologically, for some people, it's uh, harder to get into because they feel like, oh, I have to pay them every month. Uh, mm. Yeah. But then, you know, if you pay us a dollar every month, at the end of the year, you pay $12. Hey. And some people here in the Kickstarter will go in and buy something and pay like $20, $50 or something for a collectible. Yeah. And uh, they or don't think twice about doing that. And, they're, even like and they're like, well, it's – yeah, and it's almost immediate gratification, right? It's something that you get a collectible immediately and are done uh, apart from, you know, uh, whereas Patreon requires you put – your credit card in and and giving us a monthly donation every month and some people may not be that into it so i understand yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah and and uh you know also we do want to sell we we do want more people to buy our book uh and i think one one issue that we have with this kickstarter is we get so much cool stuff uh donated that the book kind of gets lost in the shuffle a little bit. I mean, there's all these rare Clive Barker collectibles and one of a kind things and, or things that are, are uh, out of print or that will never come back again. And people buy those and then, and then it's like, um, and then they don't think about the book or it's like, well, I already got something. I know. Well, the book is still a project, but uh, hashtag yeah. buy the book. Yeah. Right. Right. And 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 I, I somebody was asking about that because they and um, they said they didn't have the money for it right now. And I think that we're going to get this book finished in 2019. And I right right as right as it's going to printing, I want to give what people one last chance to pre-order and it won't be through Kickstarter. It'll be just, um, you know, well, it'll be just kind of okay. This is the last chance we're we're ordering these things, and you know we want right. people to get a chance to buy them. So you're not going to miss out. Maybe it, through a, a a PayPal donation or something like that. Yeah, we'll and we'll we'll figure out how we want to do that. But I think I I don't yeah you know, I don't want anybody to miss out on it either. I think after someone sees after we post uh, an image of an actual proof of the book. Uh, when we get it from from the whatever website we're going to get it from, um, I think that would really help in people realizing that oh the book is there the book is real I'm going to buy it so yeah. that's another thing that will definitely bring in more people is that after we're done editing it and have our first proof copy then we can probably post that as a as a, a blog post and tell people hey this is another chance you know if we're about to make the order so if you want more let us know because it gets cheaper the more you order right that's yeah. true for everything. Yeah. And uh, right now the numbers are still a little low, and I understand that the project has been going on for a while, and it kind of got a little lost in the shuffle. But we're working hard on it, and there's, like you said, some listeners are helping out and other people. So yeah, yeah, we'll we'll know more about that as we complete the editing of the book, and then we'll keep you guys posted. Yep. Then we'll be on our book signing tours. <laughs> so going back, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> or maybe who knows maybe we can grab a bunch of those and take them to a convention and and yeah. be uh selling those in line who, kn who knows you that know would, uh, it's a possibility fun. um so next uh, feedback from uh from this, uh, one of our listeners is adam ducey that said i believe this is about bloodline as well 
I would seriously pay a damn good amount of money to watch and own the original cut of this film, and I would help fund it via crowdfunding if it needed work. I've been interested in seeing it for years, especially since I've always felt that Angelique was one of the franchise's most enduring icons, one who could have been carried in future installments had things carried properly. I told that to Valentina Vargas, who, by the way, is a total sweetheart to her fans, when I saw her in August, and she totally agreed with me that her character could have carried on. By the way, here's my picture with Mrs. Vargas. And then he, he added a picture on his comment. So uh, I, I hear you, man. You know, I, that'd be great. I don't know if this would be something that could be crowdfunded. Um, again, it depends who's going to do this, who's going to handle this project. It has to be someone related to the production of the film. It has to be someone who has a publishing company like Shout or Arrow or whoever. But there has to be money people and people with legal authority to make this that have to get together and decide, let's do this. So who has the rights right now to Hellraiser Bloodline? Um, I think that might be the Weinstein Company and Transatlantic Entertainment, which I think was a group of just lawyers that invested into buying the rights from New World Cinema or New Line Cinema. Is it that Transatlantic Entertainment that keeps it from getting put into like box sets like the Scarlet Box and stuff? No idea. No idea about that. That That's another one of those things that who knows? Because when, when the rights for a movie get sold off and then they get bought by someone else and then there's all sorts of weird deals that get made. So I've, I, yeah. I don't know exactly what's going on there. Uh, and especially because this is, like I said, a, you know, an Adam, uh, Alan Smithy movie. So it seems like it's kind of disowned by a lot of people. And they just yeah. put it out really because – they didn't want the Hellraiser franchise to end in a bad note. And they still thought that they could make money out of Hellraiser 5 and 6. Yeah. And apparently they did. Well, and they put it out because they were it's like they were already halfway to the finish line and it, they'd already put it so much money into it. It's like you got to got to keep going now. Yeah. 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 So that's cool. I think Valentina Vargas would have made an excellent villain. Um, she would have been Angelique would have been an excellent villain. I just, you know, there's things that you have to consider, like what, uh, you know, was that some something that the franchise owners wanted to go with? So was that something the writer wanted to go with? Um, was that something the actor wanted to go with? Because some actors, they don't want to get typecast in certain roles. Um, I'm sure that in hindsight, she would say, yes, yes, I would love to be Angelique and be in the Hellraiser movies. But it's like, you know, um, that's one reason why Julia didn't come back for Hellraiser 3 is because Claire Hagen said, hey, you know, I I want to move in a different direction with my career and I'm really not interested in becoming a slasher film or horror film uh, queen, yeah. right? Right. It's amazing how a little thing like that uh, completely changes the direction of the whole franchise. You know, because yeah. they said, okay, yeah. well, we're going to make Pinhead the, the slasher and he's the popular character and that's how we got Hellraiser 3 the way it is. Well, that was the right decision, I think, because obviously that was the most impressive one of the characters. I mean, if they never brought Pinhead back and had just worked with Julia, I don't know how successful that would have been. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. They could have brought both of them together. That would be something. Yeah. But if it's just uh, forget about Pinhead and move on with Julia, I don't I don't know if it would have been that successful. Yeah. Well, and we've had some cool discussions on our Discord. So I, you know, I highly recommend the Discord. Our Discord community has grown quite a bit since we started it, and uh, we've had a cool discussion on Discord uh, about whether it would be nice to see a, a movie with Harry Demore come back, uh, starring Scott Bakula. You know, and I, I think hell, hell yes. You know, definitely, I would love to see, yeah, yeah. like the Scarlet Gospels with Scarlet Scott Bakula in it. That would be great. Yeah, you think? Absolutely. I was just uh, rereading a little bit of the uh, Scarlet Gospels the other day, especially the part where um, Demur was out in New York with his uh, partner Scummy, yeah. <laughs> if you remember that part in the Scar yeah. Scarlet Gospels, and uh, they find themselves in the triangle. And uh, my God, there's so many cool adventures that people could do with Demur. I mean, yeah, Lost Souls. The story, Lost Souls, which was the first story I've ever read yeah. that had Harry Damore. Um, uh, amazing Christmas story. Amazing Christmas story. Yeah. It's 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 
It's tremendous. It's short story. It reads really quickly, but it's like, it's, it's classic Barker. It's got a demon. Uh, it's got a, a person getting uh, murdered with a soup can in a supermarket. It's got a Vatican sanctioned murderer. It's got, you know, uh, a possibly uh, a surfeit of Messiah babies being born around Christmas time. Yeah. And it's just insane. It's just yeah. amazing. I would love to see Scott Bakula do a version of Lost Souls. Uh, I don't know if they could make a whole feature film out of it. Yeah. They would have to pad the story a little bit. But for me, that would be amazing. You know? or, or Not to could, mention, of course, the Scarlet Gospels. Or they could have that one take place in the 80s and and uh, and, and go back in time and, and recast, you know, as a, as a right. pre prequel story. And then have, mm -hmm. like, Hellraiser colon the Scarlet Gospels with Scott Bakula in it. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, would... you can dream, right? Yeah, I know. It's like, why, you know... It, why do it why just do, depends why do on have, uh, why do we have better ideas than the people that make the Hellraiser movies so, so much of the time? Yeah, we shouldn't. Yeah. It should like you can go and and you could, yeah, you can go back and listen to some of our first series of episodes about Duels of Blood One that we did with Max Lichter of the Pyramid Gallery, and at the time we did discuss a bunch of Hellraiser treatments that were put on the desk to uh, at the Weinstein company. And <laughs> some of those were just freaking terrible. They I were know. just terrible. Yeah. And it's I, like, you, you guys were paying people to write this. I mean, I would write something better for free. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know. And for people, although of out course there that, I was that, doing it for them that think hell world is bad. I yeah. mean, just, just read some of those, those God awful treatments that, you know, that we talked about. Cramming Hitler's heart into the body of a toddler. Yep. And yep. I don't even know what that was supposed to make. Right. They, that, they had Hitler's he would, heart. He was, that would turn the toddler into an antichrist. Yeah. Yeah. Things like that are not Hellraiser. They're not part no. of the Hellraiser universe, and they shouldn't be. That's just someone else's crappy treatment that they yeah. got hired and said, hey, I need a Hellraiser movie. What do you got? And they're like, hmm, oh, I got this story here. I could, like, change it and put some Hellraiser elements into it. Yeah, it's a cult, and they have the Lament configuration tattooed on their neck, and it's a secret cult. And I'm like, then why are they tattooing their neck? Yeah, uh, yeah. And and then there were other ones like with um with a, a like a dorm haunted uh, haunted house full of college aged kids and stuff and right, just, right oh my god so what else do we have in terms of feedback um, uh, another one says uh, James Huffman said this has been high on my list of director's cuts we need since the film was released from my understanding there are an enormous amount of post visual effects that need yeah. funding. Before we get to see this, I think the investment would be rewarding. And he's talking about Hellraiser Bloodline. Right. And that's you kind of covered that, too. I mean, I yeah. Think, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that's true. I, and I don't think nobody's going to nobody's going to do that. I think that really it just like we said, it would have to be a special feature, you know, the, yeah. way, it, the way it is with, a, you know, unfinished. And what's this here about uh, Ryan Turek on Twitter? Uh, what was this? What was he commenting about? Oh uh, yeah, that was about Hellraiser: The Toll. He he just he just saw that on uh, somebody pointed that out to him. Uh, he was talking about, oh, about okay. Tom Holland in in another in a in a Twitter conversation, and somebody pointed that that out to him, and he said, "Ooh, I'll have, I added to my Audible list because he found the Hellraiser: The Toll." Right, right, okay. Yeah. And then uh, the Matt Lee on Twitter said, "How could I not support you guys? You are so passionate about Clive Barker." And I love your podcast. Good luck. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Matt Lee. Um, that was awesome. We really appreciate it. You know, I'm still yeah. always blown away by that, that people are giving us money to keep going. Yeah, I remember reading uh, Matt Lee's Twitter when he was talking about our Sacrament episode, and he gave us a really good feedback about that one. So uh, yeah. that was that was really rewarding to read. So thank you for being a listener and continuing to support us. Yeah. And this podcast, having no beginning, will have no end. You can find the show notes for this episode and join the discussion over at www.clivebarkercast.com, where we have news, features, reviews, and links to all the ways you can connect with us. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts and every other place you can find podcasts. Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial podcast and news blog that is not affiliated with 
or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.